And that is pretty much along the following lines. There is, a, there is currently a consensus among the mainstream, as they like to call themselves, political parties, which is pretty much the parties that have governing control of uh, most major European countries. There is a pretty much, or has been, an understanding that you really don't want to get into prosecuting imams for hate speech. You really don't want to get into that sort of thing because... Islam and Muslims are a very vulnerable minority and are at risk of hate crime against them. Now, there are reasons uh, you could go into for them to think that. There have been, there was in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, uh, much less so now, I think negligently, there has been racism in British society as in other societies. It's, it's, I think it's not a negligible problem, but it's, it's it's, it's nothing like a sort of uh, tsunami of hatred and, and you know, beating and killings and all that sort of thing. But, but to hear the political elites of Europe, you would think that is what it is. It's the same reason you have the, um, the, the almost nanosecond between um, a, any terrorist incident involving a Muslim and the immediate calls by politicians for there not to be a backlash. As if European publics are always having backlashes and uh, forever burning down mosques and, and all that sort of thing. It's a complete misreading and a demonstration of mistrust and distrust of uh, the populace. And uh, I think this is worth considering. You see again, recently, after the Breivik atrocity, uh, the same thing coming up. You see, a lot of people uh, after that started pointing fingers. It happened, I know, here in Denmark, it happened in Britain, it happened around Europe and indeed in America. And it pretty much went around the following uh, route, which was that if, say, you were Bruce Bauer and you'd highlighted uh, terrible things that had happened in Norway, including honor killings and, 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 and you know, human rights abuses carried out by Muslims on Muslims, that basically you had laid the path for Breivik to do what he did. Now, first of all, I'd say that is an appalling uh, a libel on uh, the people uh, who that was claimed of. But secondly, it shows so clearly, as I say, the political motivation of people involving themselves in this. Because how can it be? How can it be if an imam in Norway says, kill people, he is not responsible? And even if somebody were killed, you go, oh, that's a misreading. You misheard. Yet if somebody who has not only never called for anyone to be killed, but has actively said quite the opposite, can themselves be blamed, as it were, for laying the groundwork? How can this be other than uh, to attribute to this a deliberate political motive? Um, if if, if uh, a, a non-Muslim explaining a, an Islamic human rights abuse is laying the groundwork for murder, but an Islamist himself calling for murder is not, something is wrong. Something is very, very badly wrong. And uh, that is the situation we have ended up in. As Lionel Shriver, the novelist and fellow columnist of my editor the magazine in Britain called Standpoint, wrote after the Bravely thing, the, the, the interesting thing about, the thing that makes mass murder is different from everybody else is the fact that they mass murder. <laughs> it isn't what they believe while they're mass murdering. Um, Breivik could believe that he was following somebody I quoted earlier, John Stuart Mill. Um, but I can assure you uh, that John Stuart Mill was not responsible for Breivik. And it isn't just because he didn't have a machine gun. John Stuart Mill had no connection with that. And nor did other people who were slandered by association with it. But as I say, you learn a very great deal about your society uh, when such obvious political uh, motivation is at play. Now, I, I said earlier we were in a mess about this, and I, I'll cite two examples of the mess that, that Europe and indeed America, I think, are in uh, on these matters. The first one, I'd say, would be the case of the uh, Quran burning. It was, um, it was mentioned earlier. Um, the interesting thing about this, by the way, is, 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 is it's almost impossible to do this from the British perspective because the pastor in question is called Terry Jones, who was also one of the Monty Python team. <laughs> and I found it very, very hard to take this story seriously from the outset, I have to say, because 
the idea that a member of Monty Python was at risk of burning a book somewhere in Latin America. Just, it was, but in any case, this ludicrous, ridiculous fringe pastor who I think his congregation consisted only of his immediate family and they wanted to leave. Um, this, uh, this, this, this pastor managed, managed to hold the world's press in the palm of his hand for weeks. For weeks, and then you have major political figures um, uh, making statements, secretaries of state. Uh, you have you have serious papers and broadcasters having, you know, uh, you open the paper in the morning, you know, there'll be a, you know, the look at the weather forecast, and, and 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 also, you know, significant possibility of a Quran being burned <laughs> in America today. You know, the the, the 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 likelihood has risen from possible to serious that this nut job's going to do this, um, and 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 you see the the complete confusion we're in. Uh, um, it, uh, I think that burning any book is a bad sign, and uh, something I would instinctively distrust. But, but why does it become worse when it offends uh, 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 this particular group? I mean, uh, are you sure you want to set that precedent? Um, are you sure that... Uh, I mean, I mean it, it, it's absurd. It, it, is, it is a definition of society ending up following things on Islamic terms rather than our own terms. Uh, there is, as I say, every reason to be very dis... You know, full of disgust for anyone who wants to burn any book. But, you know, if a group of people who are great fans of F. Scott Fitzgerald come across a bloke somewhere who doesn't like The Great Gatsby and says that in a fortnight's time he might approach it with a box of matches, <laughs> well, all the, all the F. Scott Fitzgerald fan club have to do to prevent that atrocity happening is to say that they can't promise they won't be violent if it does. So this is, this is um, preposterous. It, and and I say, if anyone doesn't realize the direction we'd be going in with that, they're extremely foolish. But as I say, there's a reason for this, which is that there is a political drive behind this. Take another example. In recent years, uh, hate speech laws in Europe have, have, have pretty much believed, as they have in Canada, and other countries have pretty much believed that, as I said before, uh, the populace we, uh, the people, are, um, are terrible, terrible bigots who just can't wait to kill people and burn things and, and, and all that. <laughs> and, and just can't be trusted. And, and, and you know, in the end, it'd be best if we, we probably didn't vote, which is why they're getting as near as they can to that by having a European Parliament. But, um, but, but the, the thing behind this that's so interesting is that the political motivation there is that, is that we must sort of, as it were, root out the last remaining remnants of certain hatreds. And let me give you an example. Um, the, the Deputy Prime Minister in Britain, called Nick Clegg, there's no reason you should have heard of him. I wish I had. <laughs> um, this, 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 this man, he, he gave a lecture to something a couple of years ago, um, I haven't been on the board of it, European Institute for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism, and he gave, a, he gave a speech in which he, um, he bravely said that he was against anti-Semitism, and among other things, came out wholeheartedly to condemn Nazism. Um, wholeheartedly, no ifs, no buts. Against Nazism. And he, I, I, fortunately, I had the first question. I said, I said, you know, it always seems to me that anti-Semitism, for instance, is, is, is much like charity, it should, you know, I mean, and the fighting of anti-Semitism is much like charity, it should begin at home. So how come you've got a radical uh, backbencher in your House of Lords, who actually at the time was one of the Foreign Affairs spokespeople for the Liberal Democrats, who's on record repeatedly saying all sorts of Islamist apologist stuff, all sorts of terrible things about Jews controlling the media, how come all that sort of thing, how come you ignore all that, but you, you're, you're tilting at this completely fictitious wimble of sort of modern-day Nazism, as if, as if the British people are about to, you know, there's a significant risk that next week they're all going to put on swastikas and start jackboots and, you know, march down. Well, you know, if it actually is your problem, if you actually do want to root out racism, if you actually do want to root out anti-Semitism, you know, start with the person sitting in your party. But of course, this is the problem. They, 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 they are fighting last century's war 70 years too late, and expect to be congratulated for their political bravery in doing so. <laughs> um, it's absolutely, let me give you another example, John Galliano. 
Extraordinary case. So John Galliano, uh, an obviously wrecked individual, uh, and a terrible alcoholic and drug addict and all that sort of thing. And one night in the gay district of Paris, he, out of his mind, starts saying disgusting things to a couple of strangers, which are anti-Semitic, which are horrible, all this sort of thing. You have all of these same worthies speaking up. I think we must condemn John Galliano. We must, uh, we must root out this sort of people. As if the biggest threat that we face in Europe from extremism is a drunk gay fashion designer in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not the case. But you can see how easy it is for It's so easy. It so is in all of the worthies, all of the groups, all of the NGOs came out they, 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 I, was, I was at a dinner uh, um, for an organisation in London that claimed to fight this sort of thing a few nights later, and somebody said, and we should also congratulate, who's that a Hollywood actress who was in Star Wars? I mean, we've got to congratulate this guy for, for now coming out and refusing to wear any more of his dresses. And everyone applauded, as if this was an extraordinary stand against the major bigotry of our time. You know, I think it, it, it's, it's not as easy as that. It's really not as easy as that. And the fact that politicians and the uh, sort of rights establishment think it is shows you so much about this. This is cowardice. This is terrible, terrible cowardice. They are, um, they are believing that they are huge heroes and are, will, 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 will pass laws until the last hour to make sure that no alcoholic designers in Paris can ever ever say that again, but they will ignore and refuse to prosecute somebody in Britain today, the imam who calls the Jews to be killed. Not as metaphor, not as metaphor, as fact, as request, as order. This is a dis the most obvious demonstration of the decline of our political class. Now, let me give you one other quick example before I come to the upside. <laughs> I, I learned some years ago you should never leave an audience in complete depression. 